Agus Madden va Huladunya. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Great. Hami and Dorcas, Gvirshikuma, Agus Falcha, Ora Ferash, Bliana Ma va Urreiv. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome back to the Plurilingual Lab Speaker Sessions, and a Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, is Mr. Paul Michan Chiblo, She Gela Hanum, Shinyach Ransakia Hanum, Agus Isma Ur Konyuk? So I introduce myself in my endangered language, Gaelic or Scottish Gaelic. Um, my name is Paul Michan Chiblo. I'm a Scottish Gael born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland, and I'm a PhD candidate in educational studies focusing on Indigenous language revitalization at McGill University. And I'm your host today for the Plurilingual Lab speaker sessions in 2022. So it's an honor to be hosting you all and to be speaking to you all today. Now, before I introduce our wonderful panel speaker today, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am speaking to you today from Toronto, Canada, and I would like to acknowledge this land, the plants, waters, animals and spirits, and all of our collective responsibilities to them. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land and territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be speaking with you all today and to work and to live on this land. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous languages of Turtle Island or what is now known as North America. Indigenous languages are inseparable from the land and are still spoken to this day in Canada and worldwide. It is important to acknowledge our collective responsibilities in ensuring indigenous languages and knowledges are equally validated and respected alongside the languages we use in language education and beyond. And on that note, I invite you all to reflect today on how you do this in your language and everyday educational practice. Miigwech, Agus, Tapale. Now, without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce you to our wonderful speaker today, Dr. Zhu Hua, Chair of Language Learning and Intercultural Communication in UCL Institute of Education, University College London. She is an elected fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and Chair of the BAAL, the British Association for Applied Linguistics. And the name of the talk today is Culture Talks, Who Makes Culture Relevant and Why? Now, just some procedural Zoom etiquette, please. Uh, during the talk, please keep your video and sound off. You can, of course, use the thumbs up or the hands clapping feature, and the talk will be recorded and available in the Prolingual Labs YouTube channel. Uh, the talk should last around about one hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for a discussion. You can post your questions in the chat box and you can unmute your microphone to ask a question at the end of the talk. I would ask you all, please, if you do have any questions that come to mind, to put them in the chat and we'll address those in the Q&A session at the end. And finally, this discussion will be moderated by Ben Kalman and will not be recorded. And that is everything that I have to say at the moment. So I would love to turn it over now uh, to Dr. Chupois. Uh, it is a great honor to have you here today speaking with us. So thank you very much. And I'll turn the floor over to you. And to everyone, please enjoy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hello, um, good, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. For some of you, delighted to be here. And thank you very much for the host and the Plurilingual Lab for organizing this. I heard, um, I mean, I, I've seen Twitter messages and people are very, very um, delighted um, to have the opportunity to connect with people all over the world um, through this uh, series. So I'm going to share the screen. Brilliant. Okay, can you see the slide? Okay, great. Okay, and this is actually my first uh, talk uh, in my new affiliation, Institute of Education, University College London. Before that, I worked in Birmingham, and before Birmingham, I worked in Birkbeck, Newcastle uh, for many years. 
So the talk today is about culture talks, uh, challenges, opportunities uh, in uh, people uh, in applied linguistics and uh, multilingualism research. And uh, the, the key message I want to uh, put across is that understanding culture, what culture does and how it does should be one of the pro priorities for applied linguistics and multilingual researchers like us. If we are to respond to the rise of tribalism and nationalism in everyday life. So I will first discuss what I mean by cultural talks, how they circulate in everyday life and how they are approached in ac academic inquiries and challenges in studying cultural differences. I then discuss what research on interculturality tell us about cultural talk in interactions the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, if I may categorize it in, um, in simplified terms. So these arrange happy, resourceful interculturalities where people um, use cultural talks to create a sense of a common ground and to facilitate engagement and learning in classroom, which I will uh, show um, in one of the slides. To other in discourses, such as nationality and ethnicity talk, and act of a distinction, which is latest, um, sort of represent my latest thinking on interculturality. And by act of distinction, I'm talking about where the hard boundaries are exposed, are imposed and contested. And I will conclude with some thoughts on where we go from here. So that's the plot. So you may have watched this movie uh, before, Minari. And Minari, um, the, uh, the, the star, uh, Yang Yuzhong, has actually um, surprised almost everybody in her um, BAFTA speech um, last year in the um, 2021 BAFTA Film Awards. And she, when she picked up the award online, joined um, the award ceremony online, she said, every award is meaningful, but this one, especially being recognized by British people, known as very snobbish people, and they approve of me as a good actor. So I'm very, very privileged and happy, and thank you so much. So I refer to this kind of talk, uh, British people known as very snobbish people, as a cultural talk. So this is a kind of talk where people talk about supposedly cultural characteristics, practices, differences as, um, differences as central. It's kind of a meta talk about culture. So I use this term as it could also imply the importance of a culture in the same way as Edward Hall, the widely recognized founding father of intercultural communication research, argued that time talks and space speaks. The S in cultural talks is both a third person singular verb marker and a plural noun marker for different kinds of a meta talk about culture or indeed cultures. So why culture talks? Culture talks is about essential knowledge about the others and ourselves. It shows one's beliefs and stance towards cultural differences and sometimes known as folk theories of culture. And these um, the beliefs and stance we all have about us, about others, and we carry, we talk about these things all the time. It also does identity work and achieves uh, interactional purposes as the Minari star did. It frequently occurs in language classroom and everyday life, but is yet to receive um, much attention from researchers and practitioners as it deserves. So I will, in this today's talk, explore the multiple effects of cultural talks, very much drawing on my own experience of working, living in different parts of the world, and also my research on intercultural communication. I hope I can make the case uh, we need to ask the questions, who talks about cultural differences and for what purposes? That's a key in going forward with intercultural communication research in the future. So uh, there were plenty of uh, um, 
public discourse talking about the cultural differences. Um, on the slide, you have seen some of the visualizations from um, the, uh, a designer who actually lives in Germany uh, for many years. And she used these um, pictogram to talk about differences in, between East and the West. As you may have guessed, uh, some of the pictures here represent, for example, the one on the top representing the di different relationship and networks. And on the left side, you see quite straightforward a relationship, but on the right side, um, you see all the things uh, going around circles and that, that, that represent the complexity of our social, nex social networks in the East. So there's similarly, there's also um, growing awareness about different ways of speaking. Uh, when I prepare for the uh, PowerPoint, uh, I did a quick Google search and it, it brought up uh, many different sites that talk about different ways of speaking. And here on the left is a blog about maybe today is my birthday, talking about indirect communication style in China. It, it's remind me very much the, 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 the lecture I took when I was actually, uh, when I was studying for a master's degree in applied linguistics back in China. We read from the literature about similarities and differences in the realization patterns of a speech act, such as request, apology across different languages, as well as within one language due to social cultural factors, such as age, gender, and power and social distance. I was curious about the cultural explanation behind the pragmatic failure when a well-meaning L2 speaker fails to follow the pragmatic rule of the target language. I frequently came across, I don't know about you, but at that time I frequently came across the literature that states that Chinese speakers are influenced by the Confucian ideal of harmony or they have a different notion of faith and therefore tend to use indirect discourse strategies when it comes to declining an invitation or making a request. So hence the cultural talks here in academic discourse, Chinese speakers who are indirect, obliging, accommodating others versus English speakers who are direct and autonomous are framed as a fact that people can rely on in explaining different ways of speaking. But there are problems as you see, as I do research uh, looking at very quickly when I uh, prepare for this uh, talk, I found on one um, on the Twitter, there is actually quite interesting tweet from um, a user called very British problems. And the, the, the speaker talks about indirect ways of peeping, people making requests. So here, as you see on the slide, how to tell people they should leave. And then they list many different ways of indirect ways of making requests. So clearly, the English speaker as represented in the literature I came across uh, many years ago is very uh, different, varied, and they have different ways of making requests. So where are the ideal English speakers in the literature? So that's the first question. The second question is really to do with um, circularity or reification. So this is actually raised by Scotland, and Scotland and Rodney Jones. When they talk about the, there is a problem, circu circularity problem when you do uh, compare different cultures. So if you start by picking a conversation between American and the Chinese, you started by presupposing that Americans, Chinese will be different from each other and that this difference will be significant, that this difference is the most important defining aspect of that social situation. So here are the problems we have if we actually start uh, comparing different culture and, and then uses culture as the explanatory factor for different ways of speaking. So I have been, you know, while I was finding this kind of a cultural talks as circulating in public discourse and also um, reinforced by academic discourse, increasingly problematic 
with its a priori approach, i.e. assuming culture as a causal factor. I had the opportunity to research on multilingual practices in Chinese migration family in the UK on the theme of dueling languages and dueling values. So in the conversation I recorded, uh, there were frequent talks about cultural ways of speaking within Chinese migrant families, which has often been researched as a homogeneous group and presented as a harmonious family with tiger moms and obedient children. The example on the slide shows uh, cultural talks in action within around the dinner table when people talking about um, uh, somebody they are going to a visitor that coming and then the conversation turned into about address terms and specifically the conversation is not just about you know who's coming who's not coming but about two generations debate about addressing a family value as Liu Gai old Liu or uncle Liu as I highlighted in circles on the slide and in the end that has to declare that in Chinese everybody is your uncle. We'll come back to this example later on, but here, these cultural talks within family made me realize not only the importance of culture in multilingual practices, but also that being interculture in the supposedly one homogeneous family, in the Chinese family, label, usually labeled as the one Chinese family, is actually there's a lot of interculturality going on in this conversation. And it, in fact, it is constructed through interaction. So we need to focus on the inter aspect intercultural communication. I use here, inter here, not only represent the people that come into contact with each other, but also a focus on interaction. So later on, I call this kind of interculturality uh, interculturality through interaction approach is not invented by me, but very much actually followed, echoed the, 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 the argument put forward by scholars who have examined the fluidity and the multiplicity of social identities. These uh, research also challenge the practices where participants cultural memberships such as Chinese, British are often treated as given and as an ex explanatory factor for one's behaviors. So interculturality through interaction approach in particular benefit from the seminal work uh, by um, many researchers. For example, uh, Nishika, her work will uh, have put it on the slide. Here is an example from her wonderful work talking about how not to be, how to be a Japanese with word, talking about the interactive, interactive constitution of interculturality. In fact, this example uh, for me is very much actually more about how not to be a Japanese with word. So as you see on the slide, in the uh, example, speaker A, who's doing uh, interview is leading the discussion on the pragmatic function of invitation in the Japanese culture. So as you see the conversation and the B is interviewing the uh, interviewee talking about their experience of living in Japan. Now, by looking at the, the, the examples on the slide, there might be people who think A is a Japanese journal, a journalist and there might be some people who think, oh, they cannot be because he keeps using Japanese people, they, they, and Japanese, these um, reference terms to refer to Japanese people as if he isn't one of them. So this is exactly the purpose of this example to demonstrate that in fact, A, as a Japanese journalist, he is actually trying to distance himself from his identity as Japanese, but put emphasis on his professional identity here as a journalist interviewing on a radio program. So I hope this is a nice example to illustrate how interculturality can, uh, people use interculturality can negotiate their identities. Here is a good example how a professional identity takes over one's 
cultural or ethnic identity in a job uh, in an interview. So in going about being uh, intercultural, um, as we usually think about when we're talking about in Chinese versus American versus a, 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 um, Canadian, as a starting point, as you will see in some of the research, as opposed to the interculturality, where cultural identity is very much regarded as accomplishment interaction, there is a shift in paradigm. So out goes the structuralist, structuralist views, which sees cultural values as explanatory, and in comes constructivist approach or paradigm, which emphasize the emergent, discursive, and dynamic nature of identities, in particular, the role of language and discourse in making some aspect of identities relevant, and at the same time making some other aspect identities less relevant to the conversation. So as I get increasingly drawn um, to the constructivist views on language discourse, I begin to explore the question of who does culture talks and for what purpose? The key uh, question I, I have been thinking and I put uh, at the beginning of this uh, talk. So in, in one, another piece of work uh, we look at, um, we did an ethnographic research looking at a social legal advice center offering support to East Europeans in UK. On the slide, you might actually see a, a, a photo of what's going on in the um, social legal advice center. And that's where the advisor sits next to the client who, who actually talk about their issues and seek help. So in this example, cultural talks is used as a strategic alliance. That's where the advisor and the, the, their clients use to build relationship. It is a quite challenging job to be a um, social legal advisor in this case, as we find, because there, he, she has to make a very, very fine line between, you know, between being supportive to, their, to her fellow uh, country people, and at the same time, offering neutral advice according to the rules and regulations, sometimes to her client's disappointment. So here, culture talks became very important resource to, for her to build strategic alliance. So in this uh, example on the slide, the client referred to M was talking about her health problem and her experience of going to court to appeal for a decision to improve her benefits. She then brought up a culture talk about Polish ways of doing things. She commented uh, in red in the, on the slide that in our Polish way of thinking, when going for such occasion, you must look decent. So she put on her best uh, her clothes uh, when she went to the court. But looking decent didn't work uh, well in her favor. In the end, she was giving a statement describing her as a well-presented and that's suggesting that she could look after herself and didn't need any help. So she learned that uh, one needs to look like a Trump in order to get help, as you see uh, it, it highlighted on the slide. So through the use of the first person inclusive plural form um, um, on the slide, she was trying to clearly uh, form granting the same identity between her and the advisor and trying to establish common ground with her. The advisor here went along and acknowledged that she heard about these so-called norms and did not actually engage in the conversation further. So this kind of culture talk clearly has been used uh, quite effectively here in this social legal advice center as a resource of building alliance. On some other occasions, I have seen culture talks becomes a conversation for co-learning. In this example, research on classroom, culture talks become conversation for co-learning and thus encourage active engagement from the students. Together with my PhD students, Kieran Norder 
we investigate students' engagement in an Akawa classroom. Akawa means English conversation in Japan, where small groups of Japanese learners' English are encouraged to converse with a language teacher. We notice that a teacher brings up topics about local food, places, and cultural practices uh, at, um, from time to time. And for example, in the conversation on the slides, he talks about annual Japanese holiday, Oba, and inquires about something he described as a reverse onigiri. Onigiri is kind of a rice cake wrapped in red bean paste. And he was talking about reverse onigiri, meaning the red paste outside and the rice inside. And we saw this is actually quite interesting metaphor to talk about what he was doing here. In fact, when talking about these kind of food talks, local practices, he was actually trying to reverse roles, his roles, reversing his roles as authority, uh, authority figure, somebody who actually direct teaching to a co-learner with her, his students in the classroom who, and the draw on their culture, the, their funds of cultural knowledge and multilingual resources to keep the conversation going. And the idea is getting students engaged in conversation to motivate their participation in the classes where they can learn and uh, to speak. So, so far we have talked about how culture talks can be helpful in carrying a sense of a common ground and facilitate engagement learning. And this is a good bit. There, is a, there, there are also the bad and ugly bits. Culture talks often contain overgeneralization, stereotypes, and even racism. We have seen how racist comments in the form of culture talks and how they are circulating in social media and the public discourse recently, uh, particularly during the pandemic. For example, the shop sign in a coffee shop in London appearing uh, to refer to COVID-19 and put down long code uh, on the, on the uh, shop side, which says this is longest that something made in China has ever lasted. In the uh, recent Tokyo Olympic games, the broadcasting company NBC was criticized for using images to represent each country during the opening Ceremony. I don't know whether you have um, picked up this news. So they use pizza for Italy and salmon for Norway. So what can we do to challenge this kind of discourse? In, in the next few slides, I will continue the theme of who does cultural talks and for what purpose with a focus on other discourse such as nationality and ethnicity talks. So linked to um, culture talks, nationality and ethnicity talk include questions or comments, which frequently occur in the small talks are used to establish, ascribe, challenge, deny, or resist one's ethnicity and nationality, a kind of a culture talk probing how different you are. So these questions and topics range from direct ones, where are you really from? or to more subtle ones, for example, your English is so good. And like many people who have lived and worked in different places, I often found these kind of questions difficult to answer, and particularly in everyday interactions. So why does um, NET and nationality and ethnicity talk matter? They matter because it, it constitutes discursive practice for othering. An other incur occurs when an individual or group of people is denied a clearly defined status, and when an individual or group of people is designated as anomalous, peculiar, or deviant, or is objectified, stereotyped, naturalized, or essentialized. And as a key concept of a post-colonial theory, othering is defined through the lens of a power dynamics as a process in which through so discursive practices, different subjects are formed and subject in powerful social positions as well as those subjected to those powerful conditions. 
So in NET, we see not only the folk series race, but also an act of a power play whereby people subjectively position and calibrate us versus others by questioning the other's entitlement, authenticity, and legitimacy. So how does NET work in interactions? You may have come across these kind of examples before. And, but what uh, can the speaker do to challenge this kind of othering and to turn the table? And how can researchers like us contribute to the understanding of othering as a social process? In the next um, slide, uh, here is a video clip uh, that shows NET in action. So this is a, um, a conversation between a man who's trying to strike up a conversation with an Asian looking young woman who's doing exercises. The, min, the, the video is about one minute and 40 seconds. And I will, when you watch, uh, maybe you could look out for the examples of nationality and ethnicity talk, and also watch how the woman respond to these kind of nationality and, and ethnicity talk and enjoy. Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. <laughs> I'm Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, um, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well... people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a Korean thing. Right, I'm going to stop here. I hope you enjoyed the video. So how, 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 how is it in action? I will um, try to explain in three slides. I got some up from Angelica, thank you. Video, uh, the man who was actually surprised by the woman's English uh, began to look for the answer he was hoping for by asking questions one by one. I hope you catch um, some of the questions uh, he asked. Uh, some of them are actually quite rude. Um, so he said, where are you from? I have highlighted those uh, bits uh, in blue and your English is perfect. Um, so these are some examples of NETs, uh, presumably driven by his folk series towards Asian looking people in this conversation. So his comments, your English is perfect in turn five, despite being a compliment, position the Asian looking woman as a non-native English speaker, a foreigner, someone who doesn't belong to English speaking country like the US. The NETs are also accompanied by his further casting in turn seven through his speech adjustment and rendition of patronizing so-called foreigner talk, where uh, he went out of his way to slow down and emphasize every syllable in his question. Uh, you may remember the way he talked about where are you from slows down every uh, single syllable. So in turn 13, he was thinking aloud and talk about his categorization 
which seem to rely upon the women's, uh, the woman's physical experience. In the last turn on the slide, the guy was trying to display his cultural knowledge about Korea. He studied the actions um, with a bow, which is more uh, typical of Thai rather than Korean style, and accompanied by a tokenistic, but completely out of the context use of a Korean phrases. So these are some examples of NEP in action. Needless to say, uh, these cultural assumptions and references are at best an ensemble of essentialized knowledge about others. So, but there's no relationship of power without resistance, without result or escape, without possible reversal, as a Foucault said. So how does the women um, respond to and challenge this ascription? As we see, the women made several attempts to resist the, the men's positioning and dismissing the categorization. So in this slide, uh, same conversation, but I, I highlighted where how the women respond to men's NET. So in turn six, you see he she used the first person plural pronoun form we in this term to depersonalize matter. And this is actually in contrast with the emphasis on your people, a plural address term used by the men in turn 11. In turn eight, she ignored the men's ascription of non-native English speaker foreigner who needs to be spoken to slowly, provided account of her connection with Orange County in attempt to routinize the conversation. She employed the discourse marker well uh, in turn eight and also in turn 12 to indicate her reluctance to be drawn into this kind of discussion. So, but perhaps the best bit for me um, of this uh, conversation lies in the second half where the woman turns the table subversively, strategically, and ironically. So in turn uh, 16 to 18 uh, on the slide, she mirrors the men's discourse strategies in ascribing the membership. She slows down every syllable the word from. If people don't usually slow down on these prepositions in the conversation, but she did anyway. She slowed down this word when asking, where are you from slowly? She also plays on the meaning of Native American, which forces the man to admit that he's just a regular American. And in turn 25 and 26 towards the end, she mocks the British way of speaking, essentializing Englishness and deliberately categorize the men as your people. And in turn 27, the last sentence, she self essentialized herself as a Korean. And she was talking about must be Korean thing. So this conversation exchange um, shows several ways of turning the table in challenging othering and resisting cultural memberships assigned by others. Uh, as you see, they are dismissing the categorization, ethnifying the ethnophile, meaning assigning cultural membership to those who assign membership in the first place, mocking and self-essentializing. I will elaborate on the self-essentializing a bit uh, in the next slide. So self-strategic uh, uh, essentialism in Spielberg's term, uh, refer to the culture, people's attempt to temporarily essentialize themselves in order to achieve certain goals. So this is the strategy used by Uncle Roger. I don't know whether you have come across uh, him and uh, his um, um, show before. So this is a guy, his real name is Nigel Ng, a Malaysian stand-up comedian of Chinese descent based in the UK. And he has become well known for his YouTube video, video critique of a BBC food video on cooking fried rice. To essentialize himself as a middle-aged Asian uncle, you may recall the example earlier, we talked about the uh, everybody, everyone in China is your uncle. So in this particular case, Uncle Roger speaks English with a pronounced a Cantonese accent and prides himself on many East Asian stereotypes. And 
some of the phrases he used in making critiques of BBC videos on frying um, rice, uh, I have put there, there. As you see, these are very much self-essentializing dis discursive uh, descriptions about particular ways of doing things. So self-essentializing turns tables and uh, together with other examples, um, for example, um, um, dismissing the categorization, ethnifying, uh, the external fires and also mocking. These are strategies people use to turn the table and challenge stereotypes. In addition to being frequently used among uh, migrants to establish in-group in solidarities and maintain a shared localized group identities, this strategy has been a uh, self-essentializing or strategic essentialism has been important starting point for the political projects of many people, including feminists, the LGBTQ group, and the indigenous people all over the world. How, when while these strategic essentialism celebrate individual and group agency, there are many occasions when identities are, are prescribed by government, institutions, peer groups, or cultural components, and hard borders are drawn between groups. So in the early uh, days of a COVID-19 crisis, naming COVID-19 as, as a China or Chinese virus or Kung Fu flu led to the rise of discrimination against the Chinese people. In the UK, with the increase of infection cases at the start of the academic year of 2021 last year, what, 2022 years ago now, university students were singled out as irresponsible and reckless and blameful for spreading the virus. The post, as you see on the slide, students are not criminal. On the windows of the student accommodation captured the resentment and frustration of those locked inside. So these examples, particularly during the pandemic and also amid the growing political uh, polarization of the past few years had made me seek to understand how hard borders, uh, uh, like what we have talked about in you know, Kung Fu flu, between different groups are drawn, and how cultural differences are discursively constructed and deployed in concrete social situations, and what consequences these dynamics have on interpersonal and intercultural relationships. One of the notions I have been developing uh, together with my colleague is um, seeing boundary setting as act of distinction, um, very much borrowing um, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's notion of distinction, which was originally developed to understand the dominance of social class and taste. And I, we're using the act of distinction to emphasize the symbolic dimension of group formation. So I have examined act of distinction as symbolic domination and the boundary context in everyday interactions. Just to give you some examples on what, what do I mean by acting distinction and how relevant and useful it can be a notion to understand group formations. So in um, Bourdieu's uh, conceptual framework, this kind of domination and boundary context take the form of symbolic power or symbolic violence Symbolic power, as explained in um, Claire Crum's work, is not something that some people have or others don't. Nor is it simply about one group dominating another. Rather, it is about how power becomes legitimate and recognized by those who are subject to it and how this kind of dominance is embedded in, in our everyday practices through symbolic systems and forms. So to foreground and capture the effect of symbolic power on people's perception, beliefs, and group formation, uh, Bourdieu opts for the term symbolic violence. For him, symbolic violence is a gentle violence, imperceptible and invisible even to its victims, exerted for the most part through the purely symbolic channels of communication and cognition. So one form of symbolic violence, according to Schwarz, uh, 
is um, it could be everyday classification, labels, meanings, and categorization that subtly implement a social as well as symbolic logic of inclusion and exclusion. And this is actually where it's particularly relevant to look at these cultural labels, how these cultural labels are used as a symbolic violence in everyday interactions. So in the recently completed uh, project, um, together with colleagues, my colleagues, Rodney Jones and Silva Yawaski, we have examined the Chinese international students' experience of being quarantined between cultures and how we have seen health behaviors such as wearing, wearing face masks have become a struggle of symbolic power that creates symbolic violence. In the early days of a lockdown in the UK, experts were mobilized to promote the message that face masks were not necessary. One of the arguments being that it would give people false confidence and thereby make people more vulnerable to infection. However, face uh, mask wearing is a very common practice in East Asia where face masks are generally believed to prevent virus transmission. Rightly at the outbreak of COVID-19, many Chinese international students in the UK started wearing them. Yet this health practice associated with acting responsibility, responsibly was subjected to symbolic violence exercised by individuals, institutions, and the authorities in the forms of acts of distinction that subtly implement a social as well as a symbolic logic of inclusion and exclusion. And on some occasions, distinction and dominance are grounded in supposed adherence to scientific evidence and communication needs. So in this um, incident, which I put on the um, slide reported by our interviewees, a university professor asked a Chinese student to take her mask off in class explaining to her that there's no research so far that shows wearing a mask works. So please take it off. I need to see everyone's face clearly. So the professor presented his health belief and pedagogical need as normal. Who would argue against him if science is on his side? The student in this case was put on the spot in order to be considered a legitimate and rational student who believes in science in the classroom and follows the professor, pr pr professor's instruction, she had to take an action contrary to her own health beliefs. And this is an example of how symbolic violence is exercised in interactions through manipulations of symbolic meaning of science and pedagogical need. Symbolic violence can also take place at institutional level. At the same university, the vice chancellor was compelled to announce that mask wearing by some students should be tolerated because it was part of their culture. Here, culture, particular practice was framed as a culture and this kind of health behavior rather than as a science is in fact another way of delegitimizing and denaturalizing it. The implied symbolic logic of inclusion and exclusion in this case is that it's subtle but definitive the culture which should be tolerated must be inferior or backward. So that's one example of how cultural talk can bring symbolic violence that's actually imposed, uh, bring subtly and bringing a symbolic logic of inclusion and exclusion as well. So among more positive notes, uh, one strategy for dealing with uh, stigmatization of face masks was to reappropriate the symbol as an emblem of more universal human identities. So on the slide is an example by a uh, University Chinese Students Association. They produce this anti-discrimination uh, poster emphasizing I'm not a virus, I am human, emphasizing the status. The, this is actually emphasizing the common rather than orienting to a particular culture, representing it as a cultural practices. So what we have seen so far is an example of symbolic violence 
exercised by the authority that controls and disciplines knowledge as well as people's bodies and thought, and some examples of resisting these symbolic violence. So a uh, quick summary. Um, in this talk, I have actually reflected um, using this opportunity to reflect on my own encounters with cultural talks in academic discourse and in my experience of living and working in different places. They appear everywhere in, and in different forms, ranging from essential knowledge and statement about the others to ethnicity and nationality talks, from genuine interest in others to self-decentralized claims, and from conversation for co-learning to acts of distinction and symbolic violence. My research interest in cultural talks have involved in this uh, last two decades from my own research in the amic approach to cultural ways of speaking to an inter approach to identity construction through interactions and then to an interest in understanding symbolic dynamics of unequal intercultural interactions such as banal racism, othering and acts of distinction. So, Applied linguistics and multilingual researchers have contributed a lot to understanding cultural talks and group relationships and through identifying patterns of culturally speaking in early days and different ways of speaking and approaching interculturality as interactional accomplishment. With the current new challenge posed by the pandemic and growing polarization in the current political and social conditions, I argue that we need to refocus our attention to acts of distinction and symbolic dimension of a group formation that's taking place, not just along the dichotomy of us versus others, but through the exercise of symbolic violence in everyday interactions and at institutional level. The acts of distinction supported with the principles from interactional social linguistics and uh, that can help us to understand the dynamics of a domination and how distinction is imposed and resistant in conversation. So finally, some thoughts about uh, where we go from here. Discursive practice of othering is only one part of racial discrimination. It is mediated by structures, institutions, and the media. So I fully endorse the proposal uh, by scholars such as Thomas and Wiho. They argued to challenge othering, it requires a collective response such as anti-racist initiative or the decolonizing education initiative we have seen in higher education, as well as professional, individual and artistic form of resistance. The refusal to re accept and reproduce without questioning the positions which are assigned to othering. And as scholars and members of a research community, we need to engage in activism and making applied linguistics and multilingual research as a socially engaged discipline. We need to be aware of the danger behind acknowledging differences and the question normality of othering. And we cannot stop at uh, locating racism on the, on the outside. We need to pay attention to multiple dimensions of power, which play a role in education setting, as well as the dangers of new forms of stereotyping through educational approaches that focus on culture. So finally, um, I want to acknowledge, uh, okay, so finally, Language, uh, I hope I have demonstrated through this talk, uh, language is powerful and influential social agent in constructing social relationships. It constitutes the key, uh, one of the key mechanisms for actualizing and challenging othering. So on the slide um, is an example of how language can achieve this. So the same new story about GCSE, which is the sort of a, uh, middle school to higher uh, school to sixth forms uh, um, exams 
before the university exam, one of the key exam uh, in the UK. So this same new story about the GCSE success of immigrant children in math and English was reported uh, in February uh, 2020. But there were two versions. One pits the immigrant children against native speakers, the other against the classrooms. You may think about one perhaps is slightly better, but the question here is why immigrant children become a separate category, a deficient group that needs to be compared with others. A more useful response is to regard differences, not a basis for drawing boundaries, but as a site of authentic ex exchange or encounter. So I want to finish uh, acknowledging my long-term collaborator, Claire Crunch and Li Wei, and the project and the project team that has inspired me. Um, I have put a three project team logos on the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>